Welcome to Arts and Music. I am your host, Victor Jan Flown, and today I'm pleased to bring you Hayden T. Skyping in from London, England. Welcome, Hayden, to the show. How are things in London Thank you for today? Me. How's things in London? Things, things are beautiful in London. They're really sunny and lovely and green outside. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful day. Yeah. So, where were you raised? Um, I was raised in a little village in New Zealand of 800 people called Mangataroto, which um, means Valley Between the Hills in, uh, in Māori, which is the, the native people of New Zealand, of which I am one. That's where I grew up. You're tribal? Very different to London. <laughs> uh, so uh, is there tribalness for you there? Yeah, there is. My dad's Māori. I'm, I'm 1 16th, um, but our tribe is actually from... Further south, um, I'm part of the Ngāti Kahanunu tribe, um, which is a slightly longer place name down uh, south of Rotorua. I talk about it in my show called Te Whakarewa Rewa Tanga Te Opi Aiwa Hau. That's, um, that almost sounds Welsh. It's such a long place name. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a tribe I'm from, Te um, Ngāti Kahanunu. Wow. That's, uh, that's interesting, man. You know? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I'm very proud of my... Um, my Māori heritage. New Zealand's, um, it's, it's very integrated. Our, our culture is very integrated integrated into, into society, into life. People, it's compulsory to speak both languages at school, like to learn how to speak um, te reo Māori. My passport supports in English and Māori. Um, street names are in English and in Māori. It's, um, it's very integrated into, into our society, and it's something as a, as a Kiwi, as we call ourselves, that we're very proud of. Well, was it apparent to you that you had a gift at a young age? Oh, I mean, when you refer to gift, I presume you're talking about like performing and stuff. I so don't see it as a gift. I mean, I, I just, I just started doing it and then people told me I was good at it. I think that's how, what you do in life. You start doing things and then when people say that's what you're good at, you kind of keep doing it just to keep getting praise. Yeah. Um, I, I started performing quite late. I had hip surgery on both my hips at the age of 11 and 12. They had to do one hip at a time um, because obviously I had to be on crutches and recover and walk on the other leg. So they had to wait for the other one, the first one to heal, and then they did the second one so the first one could carry my weight on crutches sort of thing. Um, so I couldn't play sport anymore. I couldn't play hockey. I couldn't swim. So I had to kind of find something else. I was also a really, really shy kid, which I think had a lot to do with the fact that I was kind of struggling with sexuality inside at the time and, and just not, not necessarily sexuality, sexuality, but realizing that I was different to everyone else. And in a small town, difference makes you stand out. And to be honest, at that point in time, I just wanted to blend in. I just wanted to stay unnoticed, not rock the, rock the boat, not draw attention to myself. Um, uh, so then I um, had to find something else to do because I was really shy. My grandmother suggested that I would go and tried the local theatre company out. So we went and saw a, a show they were doing, which was, I believe, a music hall in the, in the Centennial Hall in town. And um, it just looked like that they were having lots of fun. So I kind of entered because it was something that I could do with strange hips while my hips were covered because I didn't have to, you know, do any kind of sporty things. And I really enjoyed it. To be honest, the thing that made me fall in love with it, I wasn't particularly good um, at it. But the thing that made me really fall in love with it was it was um, a place for misfits. The theatre is a place, no matter what you're into, no matter how um, quirky or different you are, differences are celebrated there as opposed mm. to, um, to being ridiculed. And it was just a, a really warm family where I was encouraged to be myself, which is kind of ironic, really, because the whole point of acting is you become someone else. But but they celebrated me and welcomed me for who I was. And, uh, um, and I really kind of found confidence in that. And that was at age, like, as I say, like it started really around 13, 14 after the hips had healed. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how it all began really. And now I love it. I mean, now it's, it's not only my career, but it's, um, it's, it's my passion. Right, 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 right. Uh, so what was your first acting role? 
I think the first one was a play that a local woman uh, called Maureen Davies had written called Crumbling Towers, which was kind of like a New Zealand version of Faulty Towers. Um, and, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can say this. This is highly inappropriate now. Um, but as a 14-year-old boy, I didn't realise. I played John Smith, a Eurasian tourist. And with all the cultural, cultural appropriation and and things that I would obviously never do today, and you probably should edit this out so I don't get um, <laughs> get slack online. But that was the first role. Um, yeah. It was it was a young man tourist who had come to find his illegitimate father. Um, that was, but as I say, it was written by a local woman in our small little town in the what was you know early to mid nineties. So with your training, did you have formal training uh, with the voice or was it both acting and the voice or? Yeah, I had, there was a, a local singing teacher called Joan Kenaway, um, who actually passed away last year, which is um, very sad. We were, remained very close right up until the end of her life. Mm -hmm. um, she is, she was and still is a, a big force, not only in the community, but in the whole of New Zealand. She's a very well established um, was a very well established teacher and singer in her in her own right. She really uh, trained me in singing, gave me the confidence. Then, when I was older, at I think age of sixteen, I moved to Auckland and went to um, another singing teacher called King Cornish, um, who was amazing. Who also passed away very recently, actually. Um, and he really um, through the years with him is when I realised that I could do it as a career and that I wanted to pursue it as a career. And then when I was eighteen, I moved um, away from New Zealand to Australia to study um, drama and musical theatre at NIDA, which is the National Institute of Dramatic Arts in Australia. It's mm -hmm. um, it's widely known as well widely known down under as the the best um, drama school in the Southern Hemisphere. Kate Blanchett went there, Mel Gibson went there, Jeffrey Rush went there, um, Philip Quast went there. It's kind of like if you, it was my dream when I started like at 14, I was like, oh gosh, and it, if I can get into neither, that would be amazing. And um, I feel very privileged that I went there. Uh, what was your first show at the Pittsburgh Public Theater and how did it come to be? And was it your my first US performance? Uh, my first show at the Pittsburgh Public Theater was Camelot. Um, where I played King Arthur, um, it came to be, I was, well, this will answer this and the, the next question. It, it wasn't my first American performance. My first American performance was playing Captain Hook and Peter Pan, um, directed and choreographed by Michael Lichtfeld. And, um, and while I was there doing that, um, my agent called. The same casting director who had cast me in Peter Pan um, was a casting director for Ted Pappas at the Pittsburgh Public Theatre in New York at the time, and contacted my agent and said, uh, I think Hayden would be right for what Ted wants to do with King Arthur, which was, at that point in time, we're going back a few years, Vic, um, I was a little younger, and I was, I think, I was 30, and, um, and, and that was very young for King Arthur, and Ted wanted to make it a, a much younger, uh, fresh-looking production. So I, I think we were performing Peter Pan in... Happy Valley, Pennsylvania, and I would get into my Chevy Impala, which was the rental car they provided me, and I drove all the way back to New York uh, after the show that night, which I think is about seven hours, and bearing in mind it's on the other side of the road from what I'm used to, and um, yeah. and I didn't really know my way around America yet. I'd only arrived, I think, a week before I booked Peter Pan, so it was all very, still very new to me. Drove back, um, met Ted, auditioned for Ted only once, Got a call back that I couldn't make it because I was seven hours away in Happy Valley with his, and I also was doing a show, so I couldn't make the call back. So Ted worked with me in the room. As, uh, it was a long audition, I remember. I don't know the exact time. Um, but obviously I showed him enough for him to cast me. And then I think I had about two weeks from when Peter Pan finished and when Camelot started. And I remember um, I went back to New Zealand and Australia and then, uh, like, for... And, and then on, I think we started Chris Boxing Day rehearsals and I was staying at an airport hotel in New York where I flew back in and all of a sudden there was a massive snowstorm and all of the airports were closed. <laughs> and uh, Kimberly Burns, who was cast as my, as my uh, was cast as Queen Guinevere, um, uh, we were opposite each other, and she all of a sudden messaged me on Facebook, we'd never met, and she's like, our flights are cancelled, 
I'm going to rent a car and I'm going to drive us there. And I was like, this is perfect. This is the perfect way to start. We had like um, hours in, a, in, a, in the snow driving, Jenny's driving her walk <laughs> to the start of rehearsals. And that was how we got to know each other. So we arrived in Pittsburgh having spent hours in a car together, you know, driving to the snow. It was very romantic. We knew a lot about each other. We kind of fallen in love by the time we arrived. It was, it was not how it was planned, but it was an amazing start. I mean, I, I have the most fond memories of that production. Who has influenced you with your acting? Oh, my God. Well, every, every person I've ever worked with on stage mm. influences me. Every, every director I've ever uh, worked with influences me. Growing up, I loved Philip Quast, who was an Australian um, performer, Anthony Warlow, another Australian. Um, oh, God, Michael Ball, um, all the divas, Angela Lansbury. I mean, I, I'm inspired by all these amazing people. Philip Quast and Anthony Warlow are probably the two that growing up though that really I really idolized and looked up to and I don't know tried to emulate I guess is it tough to find yourself after a role yeah it is I I get what I like to call character hangover a lot and it doesn't mean that I'm I'm not method at all as you know we've been backstage I break character when I leave the stage I go back to being hated I believe that's personally for me Which, that's important it's quite amazing um, actually that you do that I think it's, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's important to hold on to, to not get too lost. Because I do get character hangover. I do, but the, not that I become the person, but the, the things that I uh, have in common with the character um, tend to become a little heightened in my real life. Uh, um, like thinking back to Arthur, I was engaged at the time. And that obviously didn't, didn't work out because I'm as single as single can be. But... Um, <laughs> But at the time I was engaged and we were doing long distance and I remember just being very open to the idea of opening up our relationship um, to make it work. And that's very much what Arthur was. He kind of, he was like, knew that Jenny and Lancelot were having an affair, but kind of turned his blind eye to it because he loved her so much and just wanted the marriage to work. Mm -hmm. And I kind of remember going through that <clears throat> at the time when I was playing Javert, I would become a little self-righteous at times. Plain Trunch, I'm actually really childish because I believe she's just a big nasty bully in a playground and Matilda's actually the most um, mature character in the play. Um, so I always get character hangover. In terms of shaking the character off at night, I, at the end of a performance, I have found over the years playing Javert for so long, I actually ended up having to go in, having to go to therapy for it because I was, I was becoming him a little bit too much. So I, in, in Australia, there's an amazing thing that you do not have in America where if you go and say, I'm struggling uh, mentally with my mental health due to something. So I, I went along to a doctor in Australia and said, I'm struggling because I had to kill myself eight times a week for four years. You know, I had to jump off the bridge. And I'm fine. I'm not having suicidal thoughts, but I'm finding it a challenge to to shake him at the end of, of a performance. Right. And the doctor signs the doctor signs me off for ten um ten free therapy sessions. That's what Australia does. I think the UK might be similar. Um so I went along and had ten sessions while we were in Brisbane. And one of the things that the the um the therapist recommended was having a fragrance, anything that's sensory that you can have associated with the role that you can then wash off and then replace with your own. So I have now, ever since when I play a role, I have a fragrance assigned to that character. So I get to the theatre when I'm getting ready, I play, spray the cologne or perfume or whatever it is on for that character. And then at the end, I have my shower, wash the scent of that person away and then put Hayden's back on. It's a sensory way of... Um, of Firstly, reminding myself of the character and then being able to wash it away at the end of the night. So I'm not, you know, terrorizing children in the street as Miss Trunchbull on the way home. <laughs> or terrorizing people in the wings. That <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> the wings backstage. So how, how did the Lay Miss roles come about? Because you did Les two Miss, different roles, um, yes. I did. So I, I first played. Um, Marius here in London in 2005, 2006. Oh my God, that's so long ago. Um, I was in Australia at the time performing. I did uh, a show at a little theatre called Parramatta Riverside. 
Uh, it was a cabaret show, and there were five people in the audience that night, and I was mortified. I said to my manager at the time, Les, I can't go out there in front of five people. I mean, how embarrassing. He's like, you're doing it. Get out there. <laughs> and we're going to add this is the moment into the show that, tonight. And I'm like, what? I do know this is the moment, the song, but I really don't think it's got nothing to do with my life. This show's semi-autobiographical. And he's like, you're doing it. This is where it's going. I didn't realize why at the time. Um, so I went out, I did the show, and then afterwards I was standing in the foyer talking to the five people. And one of them came up and said, hi, my name's John Robertson. I am executive producer and casting director for Cameron McIntosh worldwide. Um, we're looking for a Marius for our West End production. Are you free in five weeks to fly to London to audition? And I was like, mm -hmm. oh my. So, yeah. and, and my manager had no one. He'd set the whole thing up, which is why he put that song in, which oh. is why he... I mean, he was very smart about it all. So I moved, I, I flew to London five weeks later, auditioned, uh, then auditioned for Cameron and got the role. So I moved to London um, that following year. But yeah, so then, and then cut forward to 2014, I was in San Francisco doing an out of town tryout of a new musical called Being Earnest, uh, a, a musical version of The Importance of Being Earnest set in the 60s, so the, a 60s score by Jay Groska and Paul Gordon, mm. which was great fun. And I all of a sudden got a message from Les again, the same manager in Australia, saying, would you be interested in auditioning for Javert for Australia? I was like, yeah, sure. So I put down a video in San Francisco, sent it along, and then the show closed and I flew to New Zealand for what was going to be a two weeks with my family in New Zealand break um, before heading back to America to do... Well, I think it's 1776 at the Pittsburgh Puppet Theatre was next. Um, so I went to New Zealand and, um, no, I was doing 1776 when I sent the audition video. And then I was in New Zealand and I got a call from Les again, um, that manager in Australia, saying they'd want you to fly over. This was a Tuesday. They want you to fly over. And I just landed in New Zealand. They want you to fly over on Friday to Australia to audition in person for Cameron. So... I flew to Australia, um, auditioned once for the panel, and then they said, right, come in tomorrow for Cameron. And he offered me Javert in the room, mm -hmm. in the audition room. And that's my return back to Les Mis. Wow. And you did it all over the world, pretty much. I mean, Yeah, Australia for two years, Broadway for, a year, uh, for seven months, Dubai for a few weeks, just over a month, two months, and then to London for a year. So... I wanted to ask you about seven years. Uh, yeah. Why did you pick the, the song Seven Years? And then where did you produce it? Okay, so I was doing a play in Sydney at the time called Only Heaven Knows, which is an Australian play with music um, at the Hayes Theatre, which is fast becoming a real um, creative hub in musical theatre in Australia. A lot of new works have been produced there. A lot of revivals are being um, created there. It's a, it's a really exciting theatre to, to, to work in, and I've been wanting to work in it since it st started, which is only quite new. It's maybe about five years old. Um, so they asked me to do this play, so I went there. I was also having a birthday at the time. Um, so we're going back two years. How old am I now? I'm 38 this year. I must have been turning 36, I think. Um, and I was ending a relationship, and our song was seven years, was that song. So I'd really listened to the song lots. I'd kind of gone through, gone through it, listening to it, mourning that relationship. And I just love the song. I think it's amazing. And I think it's, and I was like, oh, I really wanted for a long time to marry my loves of acting and singing and makeup. Like, I, for years, I thought that no one would take me seriously if I was a makeup artist. No one would believe that I could act and sing well as well. And vice versa, that no one would believe that would take me seriously as a makeup artist if I act and sing. Yeah, you know what I mean. No, I couldn't do both well. And then I realized that I got to the point where I'd proven over the last 10 years that I can sing, I can act, I'm working. And then after a couple of years in New York, I designed 14 shows at, at New York Fashion Week, designed the looks for those designers, and I felt like I proved that I'm a, um, uh, a competent makeup artist as well. I was like, it's time where they're not going to take away from each other. I'm going to marry these two things together, and it's important for me to be able to express myself creatively through all the outlets that I enjoy and know how. So I came up with this idea to do this video. Um, through this song, 
seven years. It, it basically, he's talking about his father aging. Um, and I wanted to, throughout the video, age myself to 70, which is the age that uh, um, the father dies in the song. So it takes a while to age yourself with makeup. You can't really do it in the length of one song. So I came up with this crazy idea. I wasn't sure if it was going to work. The, the videographer, um, the director, they weren't sure it was going to work until we all got in the room uh, and tried it. But what we did is we, I recorded the song with a 65-piece orchestra in Budapest, same orchestra that I just used for my next album, actually. And, and it's a, so it's a big uh, symphonic kind of sound. Then I went into a studio. We, I got up at 2.30 in the morning, by the way, and Skyped into Budapest while they recorded the song. Um, then I went into a studio in Sydney um, with Ed Said uh, in King's Cross and recorded the vocals. Then we got that mixed, and then we halved, halved the speed of the song down to half time, <clears throat> which sounds horrific. Vic, if I were to send you a clip of it, it's like, it's ineligible. <laughs> then I had to l learn the song like that so I could lip sync to it. Yeah, yeah. And so I could do my makeup at the same time. So I'd, it was it was a really intense day. We only got to do it about four times because the 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 makeup I was using is a stuff called collodion, which you use to do scars on your skin, and it tightens the skin up. So I decided I could use it for wrinkles because it would tighten the skin up within the time frame. It works very quickly. But then the remover that you use to remove it is like removing acetone. It's like acetone. So it's like re you remove parts of your skin. So after doing this four times, I started to look like I, my skin started to flake wherever I had used it. So I couldn't, my skin couldn't handle doing it anymore. Um, so we then, we aged it and then sped the clip back up and it synced and that's the video that we have. I was seven years old My mama told me Go make yourself some friends Or you'll be lonely Once I was seven years old It was a big, big world But we thought we were bigger Pushing each other to the limits We were learning quicker By eleven smoking herb And drinking burning liquor Never rich so we were out To make a steady figure Once I was eleven years old My daddy told me Go get yourself a wife Or you'll be lonely Once I was eleven years old I always had that dream, like my daddy before me So I started writing songs, I started writing stories Something about that glory just always seemed to bore me Cause only those I really love will ever really know me Once I was twenty years old, my story got told Before the morning sun, which life was lonely Once I was twenty years old I only see my goals, I don't believe in failure Cause I know the smallest voices, they can make it major I got my boys with me, at least those in favor And if we don't meet before I leave, I hope I'll see you later Once I was twenty years old, my story got told I was writing about everything I saw before me Once I was twenty years old Soon we'll be 30 years old Our songs have been sold We'll travel around the world and we're still roaming Soon we'll be 30 years old
I'm still learning about life. My women brought children for me, so I can sing them all my songs and I can tell them stories. Most of my boys are with me, some are still out seeking glory, and some I had to leave behind. My brother, I'm still sorry. Soon I'll be 60 years old. My daddy got 61. Remember life, and then your life becomes a better one. I made the man so happy when I wrote a letter one. I hope my children come and visit once or twice a month Soon I'll be 60 years old But I think the world is cold Or will I have a lot of children who can warm me Soon I'll be 60 years old Soon I'll be 60 years old Will I think the world is cold Or will I have a lot of children Once I was seven years old, my mama told me, go make yourself some friends or you'll be lonely. Once I was seven years old. Once I was seven years old. Now you are in London, and you are Matilda, yeah. the musical, playing Miss Trunchbull. Is it a challenging yes. role? It is the most challenging role I've ever played in my life. It is harder than anything else I've ever done by miles. Um, Vic, you don't understand. <laughs> my friend, <laughs> she is hard. Um, the struggle is real. Uh, it took three months of rehearsals to get where I, the first day of rehearsals, we all met each other and then they had a fitness session for me. And I looked at the schedule. I was like, day one, beginning fitness. And um, Dan, Dan McDonald, Dan, Dan, the acro man, they called him, trained me daily and for three months until, re until I opened. And until three days before my first night, I was not sure I would be physically able to get through the things she does. She jumps on a trampoline, does a somersault in the air, and then lands onto a mat. I mean, you know me, Vic. I barely walk in time with the music. I am not a dancer. I am not <laughs> a mover, even. I'm certainly not a gymnast. So, but she was an Olympic gymnast. She was, a, you know, the, the shot put thrower. So she's very physical. Hayden is not. It is, the struggle is real. I throw a kid around by her pigtails um, every <laughs> night. Um, that's very, very challenging, uh, and lots of strength is required for that. It I is, would think so, yeah. It's, it's definitely the hardest role I've ever played, but it's incredibly rewarding. I love it. But I'm also only doing it until September, and my body is grateful because I come crawl home. Some nights I can hardly walk, and my, my feet ache, and, um, and I just come home and fall into an Epsom salt bath and have to you know, look after the body, roll everything out, get it stretched, get everything ready to be able to do it the next day. Right. It's, um, it's a right. challenge, but it's a, it's a very rewarding challenge. Uh, you mentioned to me a new album uh, you're releasing. Can you fill us in on the details? Yes, I can. I'm very excited. This has been, um, it's been going on for a few years. When I started in Les Mis in Australia, so 2014, I was like, I want to do another album. I've done two solo albums already. I want to do a, a third one. And I want this to be big. I want to, to uh, you know, I'd done the seven years with the Budapest Orchestra, so I knew they sounded amazing. I want to use them again. So I flew with my musical director to Budapest um, for a day, and we recorded nine tracks in one day. Um, I then uh, went and did the vocals in Sydney and Melbourne and a little bit in London, kind of depending on where I've been with work. I've recorded them in three different studios. It's been mixed right now. It's um, The uh, title of the album is called Face to Face, which is kind of a little nod to my makeup life because, I mean, the roles to me are a lot of the faces that I've created from the designs of the makeup designers from the show, of course. But I, I do think of, like, a lot of playing the roles as creating those faces 
for me. So, um, and it's also a, so a line from the song Stars, which Javert sings in Les Mis. So um, it seemed like a really good title for me, mm -hmm. to me and for me. Um, it's all done. It's been mastered. It's coming out. We don't have an exact date, but I think it'll be July, August um, with, uh, with Broadway Records, um, who, have, um, who are amazing. They're behind a lot of Broadway cast recordings, and I just had a meeting with them, and they're like, yeah, we'd love to release your album. So it's something that I've done myself. I paid for it all myself. It's cost me a fortune. <laughs> like, no. I actually... I actually could have not I a could have bought or built a house with the amount of money I've spent on it over the years. But you know what? I believe it's, that it's legacy. Yeah. It's legacy because right. to me, right. I'm I'm a, I'm a theatre performer. If you are not in that theatre for that moment, nothing that I do lives on past that moment. It's yeah. only for the people who see that. So this is something that I can leave behind. I, I'm a almost forty year old gay man. I've come to to the conclusion that I'm probably not going to have kids of my own. Mm -hmm. I mean, never say never. If I fall in love and meet someone, but I, I think I've only got a few more years before I'll be too old to have kids. So, you know, this is my legacy. This is, you know, this is something tangible that you can hold that will live on after I'm gone. So that's, it doesn't matter that I've spent all that money. I'm, I'm happy to spend all that money. I just, um, I wanted it to be right and I wanted it to be good. And I, I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you, do you have any advice for anyone who wishes to be an actor or a singer? Um, yes, just don't give up. If you, I wasn't very good. A lot of people told me I, it would never happen. When I was 14, a singing teacher called Alison Sargent said to me, if you work really, really, really hard, I could maybe get you into the chorus of an, of a, an amateur musical. And now I've been lucky enough to play leads in the West End and on Broadway. Um, right. <laughs> so the, the advice I would give you would be don't listen to the haters. Just listen to the people who love you. Have blinkers on looking at your, at your goal and make it happen. In my mind, there is no option but to succeed because success is the thing that will make me happy and my happiness is paramount. And Absolutely. I just, just, yeah. just focus on that. Yeah. The mm. universe will provide. If I, if I do all my work and work as hard as I can and am as prepared as I can be for those opportunities, then the universe will provide them for me. I agree. That's my advice. I agree. That's awesome. Don't uh, pay the haters no mind. What does RuPaul say? Unless they pay in your bills, don't pay them no mind. <laughs> and that's exactly it. And it's funny Bye. how it's, it's crazy like how many people hate. I get it myself. Oh, I just don't understand it's like, it. Why? Supporting each other is much more of a good thing than trying to tear Absolutely. each other down, right? It's absurd. No, I, you have to build, bring, build each other up. A thing I've learned in the last, and not, not that I didn't believe this before, but it's become very evident recently in the last, you know, five, ten years, is there is enough room in this world for everyone to succeed. There Absolutely. really is. There yeah. is enough success out there for everybody to have some. I don't need to drop, to take someone else down in order to build myself up. Right. And uh, in fact, it's easier to build everyone else up. You will build yourself up as well. Like I, I firmly, firmly believe that there are enough roles out there. There's enough success out there. There's enough um, money out there, whatever it is, there's actually, don't believe there's not, there is enough for everyone. I agree. I'm right with you. And the last question will be, how can people get in touch with Hayden? Oh, mm. what? Well, do you want to get in touch with Hayden? Um, people, Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, those are things that, I mean, when I first started in Pittsburgh, I didn't even know if I had Twitter. I don't think I did it during Camelot. I don't um, think so back then. I don't, I don't know. No. I mean, it's, it's, the world is so different now with social media. I wish I had it when I was, when I was coming up, I would have been writing to Anthony Warlow and Philip Cost and Angela Lansbury and all these people. Um, I mean, gosh, I'm kind of glad I didn't because I probably would have embarrassed myself. But I like it; it's so accessible. I like that someone can write to me on Twitter after after a show if they enjoy it. And you know, and it's nice to hear those stories. Not not you know not 
not to feed your ego. I just know what it was like sitting in a theatre for the first time. I know what it's like falling in love with musical theatre. If I can be a part of any small part of someone else loving theatre and getting a kick out of that, then I'd like to hear about it. Mm -hmm. Twitter. Mm -hmm. And also your your website, which is what? HaydenT.com. Oh, yeah. Yes. HaydenT.com, yeah. So Twitter at HaydenT, Instagram at HaydenT, uh, and, and my website, HaydenT, H-A-Y-D-E-N-T-E-E.com. I'm glad you're prompting me, Vic. I mean, I'm so useless at this stuff. <laughs> Well, I want to make sure that everybody gets to know you because uh, you're such a wonderful person. And iTunes, face to face on iTunes. Right, right. <laughs> Coming out in July or August. Exactly. <laughs> Buy it. Support Hayden. Uh, oh, yeah. Support really good stuff, you know? I mean, people need to support each other. So, Hayden, thank you so much. I know you're so busy. I appreciate you doing this with me. And now I get to edit it and all that, so it'll take me a little time, but, you know. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure, Vic. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I appreciate yes. it. All right. Well, you have a great day. Lying in my bed, I hear the clock tick and think of you turning in circles confusion is nothing new flash back to warm nights almost left behind suitcase of memories time after sometimes you picture me I'm walking too far ahead you're calling to me I can't hear what you said you said go slow I've fallen behind the second hand unwinds if you're lost you can look and you will find me time after time if you fall i will catch you i'll be waiting time after time time after time